All right, hello everyone. Um, this is exam number five review. Um, so this is module um, five. It covers lectures 37 through 42, for, um, 42 being this uh, review. Um, so if you think about the past lectures that we've had, we haven't really covered too much material. So this exam um, actually covers everything that we have previously talked about, including ABO discrepancies, wheat D testing, um, moms and baby, donor collection process, donor deferrals, um, special techniques in blood banks such as autogolous collections. Um, the new material from Module 5 that you should concentrate on um, pay close attention to quality assurance and quality control lecture um, in the blood bank. Specifically, pay attention to the record retention and document control. Um, and we'll go th through some sample questions um, about that. Um, and then also, uh, you will have some frequency calculations on this exam. Make sure that you are familiar with the percent of population that have the D antigen. Right, so 85% of your population is D positive, meaning that 15% of your population would be D negative. For all other frequency, um, the antigens, frequency of the antigens, um, they will be provided for you. So if uh, the patient has a Duffy, e, a Duffy A and an E, the frequency of the E antigen and the Duffy A antigen will be given to you. I don't want you guys to spend time memorizing those frequencies. Um, but just be aware of that D one. Um, and keep in mind when you are doing these frequency calculations, if your patient has an antibody and you are trying to determine the number of units that should be cross-matched, you want to use the percent of the population that is antigen negative. Do not forget that. That is a common mistake among students is that they will take the antigen frequency, the percent of the population that has the antigen. Okay, so make sure when you're phenotyping to honor a patient's antibody, we want that antigen negative percent, all right? Um, and then also make sure you guys review, you will have several sections of questions on moms and babies. Um, so number one, does the baby have D8, uh, does the baby have hemolytic disease of the newborn? The way you can answer that question is to look at the DAT. If your DAT is negative, that baby does not have hemolytic disease of the newborn. Uh, the second question is look at, and if the, the DAT is positive, um, remember we have two different types of reasons. Um, the first one is uh, due to ABO compatibility, and we will see this if mom is type O. Um, and then so mom's anti-A or anti-B or A comma B, um, she has a very small amount that is IgG and can cross the placenta and attach to baby cells, whatever type the baby might be, A or B. Okay, um, so that's ABO, hemolytic disease of the newborn. The other one is hemolytic disease of the newborn due to another IgG antibody, anti-D being the most common, um, followed by little c and Kel being the um, second and third most common IgG antibody associated with hemolytic disease of the newborn. However, um, any IgG antibody that has the capability to cross the placenta can cause hemolytic disease of the newborn. Um, and so remember, if we suspect ABO, then we would want to do a Louis freeze elution. Um, and if you expect a um, hemolytic disease of the newborn due to a, another IgG antibody, we would want to do an acid elution. And remember, when you do those acid elutions, you must, or both the Louis freeze and the acid, you must save your last wash. All right, and you will run your last wash in conjunction with your eluate. That last wash must be negative in order for that test to be valid. All right, so, um, and that just ensures appropriate washing was performed during the elution process. If your last wash has any positivity, any reactions in it that invalidates your eluate, it must be repeated. Okay, so the last wash 
his kind of like a built-in quality control to make sure that the cells um, were washed appropriately. And I want you guys to understand this eluit is done on fetal cells, either cord blood, um, or if the cord blood is not available, then you can do a venous sample, okay? Um, we do make sure you understand the testing that is performed on mom versus the testing that is performed on baby, okay? So if baby DAT is positive, that indicates something is coding baby cells, um, the maternal antibody, so we want to elute that antibody off so we can identify it. So we are testing baby cells um, in the Louis freeze or the acid elution in this case, okay? Um, now, if you're doing a fetal screen on the mom, that uses mom's sample. So we're trying to detect the presence of RH positive fetal cells in a RH negative mater maternal circulation, okay? So just be aware of what sample is being tested. Um, Louis freeze, acid elution on your baby cells, a um, fetal screen is performed on your mother cells, okay? Um, and then make sure that you um, can identify if mom should receive a Rogam. So any RH negative mom is given Rogam at 28 weeks gestation. Okay, we don't know what the type of the baby is at 28 weeks. So every RH negative pregnant female will receive a antenatal dose of Rogam at 28 weeks. If upon delivery, that mother delivers an RH positive baby, she should receive a postnatal dose of Rogam within 72 hours from delivery. Okay. Um, if she delivers an RH positive baby. Now, um, a, I want you guys to understand a fetal screen must always be done before that postnatal dose of Rogam is given. And the reason for that, if there is any type of fetal maternal hemorrhage that occurs during the delivery and there is extra RH positive fetal cells introduced into the maternal circulation, the mother could potentially need an additional dose of Rogam rather than that one vial of Rogam. So remember, one 300 microgram dose of Rogam will clear a 30 mil whole blood bleed of RH positive cells, okay? Um, you can think of that as 30 mils whole blood or 15 mils of fetal uh, red cells, okay? Um, so being able to interpret if mom is given Rogam. If mom is RH negative and delivers an RH negative baby, there is no need to give that postnatal Rogam, okay, because she was not exposed to the D antigen. Um, so exam five is 48 questions. It is worth 80 points, and the questions will be in the format of multiple choice, matching, and true and false. So let's just go through um, some example questions. Um, keep in mind, the, in our quality assurance uh, lecture, we talked about some accrediting agencies or regulating agencies. Blood bank is the most heavily regulated department of the lab. And the reason for that is because the products that we provide for transfusion to these patients is considered a drug. So not only are we regulated by CAP, um, AABB, which is voluntary, by the way, but uh, most blood banks, if they're CAP accredited, they're also AABB. They will follow both of those guidelines as well as they must follow the guidelines set forth by the FDA. Um, and blood banks are susceptible to inspections from all of those accrediting agencies. Um, and then we talked about some development of QA projects. So remember, QA projects um, really involves quality improvement, identifying an area um, that, or a problem, a reoccurring problem that could be addressed and is an area for improvement. So if you have a consistent floor um, within your hospital that consistently um, sends short samples or mislabeled samples to the lab, that is a very good project for quality of improvement, which is under your quality assurance plan. Um, maybe, and remember how 
the quality improvement project works, you will establish a team that usually involves some testing technologists, maybe a supervisor, the nurses on the floor, the clinicians, the doctors, right? You wanna make sure you have all of the stakeholders in place. Those stakeholders will work together, identify the issue, investigate the issue, what's causing it, and then they will develop an action plan. How can we correct it, keep it from happening in the future? Um, so if we wanted to reduce the number of mislabeled specimens in blood bank, because that warrants a automatic redraw for the patient. So we're actually improving patient outcomes through this quality improvement project as well. That would be a really good example. Um, implementing better policies for processing blood product orders is another one. Um, not a, an example of a not so good QI project would be identifying Bombay people who were mistyped for ABO at your institution. All right, so what percent of the population is Bombay? It's extremely rare. Um, so to have your transfusion committee, your QA committee work on this, they're not going to have um, a very large sample size to investigate. So that would not really be worth the time and effort put into quality improvement because it's just not going to happen that often. Um, and then compare manual versus computer cross-match results of a IAT negative patient. Um, If you have a if you have IAT negative patients, um, the computer can adequately choose those units. Um, the, the only thing there is ABO compatibility. So, all right. So if you have an RH negative person that is given RH positive blood a year ago. What would be the current DAT results if polyspecific AHG is used? Okay, so remember, if you have an RH negative patient that is exposed to RH positive blood, they could potentially be alloimmunized and build anti-D. However, that anti-D, um, if this happened a year ago, that anti-D will not affect their DAT. All right, so a year from transfusion, that DAT is going to be negative, okay? Um, and what's the most common reason for neonatal transfu transfusions? This is the iotrogenic. Um, so usually these small patients will become anemic just from the amount of blood that is drawn for lab testing. And if a physician repeatedly orders blood for patients with a 34 hematocrit, who should talk to the physician? All right, so this is a really good project for your transfusion committee, okay? Um, the transfusion committee would identify the problem um, and then they would develop some guidelines and retraining for the individual that is consistently trying to transfuse patients with a hematocrit of 34%. It is just not clinically necessary to transfuse patients with that um, hematocrit. All right, and remember from our um, quality assurance lecture, what percent of ABO proficiency test must be correct. So remember that proficiency testing is coming from your regulatory agencies such as CAP, um, and usually you'll have to do, um, you'll have to uh, adequately document that each technologist is involved in proficiency testing and that ABO testing has to meet the criteria of 100% accuracy, okay, on determining your um, ABO types. So if you are cross-matching two donor units um, and one reacts at AHG, what is the most likely cause? All right, so two scenarios here. One is, um, the donor has a positive DAT, right? So something is coding the donor cells, whether it be drug induced or that donor has a uh, positive DAT due to some other reason. Another reason is your recipient has a antibody to a private antigen that was not included on your IAT, right? So maybe your patient has a antibody to a rare antigen. 
um, so that it was not picked up on the IAT, but this unit is antigen positive for that private antigen corresponding to your patient's antibody, okay? Um, when is the knowledge of cell phenotyping useful? So when would we want to cell phenotype? Well, if you have a patient in the blood bank and you identify that patient as having an antibody, then you need to find antigen negative cross-match compatible donor red cell units. Um, so we have to phenotype those units to make sure that they are antigen negative. Another instance of where phenotyping is useful um, whenever we identify an antibody, we want to make sure that our patient is indeed antigen negative. Therefore, um, it further provides accuracy in identification of um, the antibodies. Okay, so remember Landsteiner's rule, in order to build the antibody, you must be antigen negative. All right, so phenotyping donor units, donor red cell units, or patient cells to obtain your patient phenotype. Okay, so how many vials of Rogam should be given if five fetal cells are observed in 250 red cells? So remember your Rogam calculation. So this is a Kleihire Betke performed. They saw five bright pink cells. Remember, your hemoglobin F within the fetal cells is resistant to the acid treatment. So those fetal cells remain bright pink. Your adult hemoglobin A cells, which would be your maternal cells, um, become like a ghost like a light pink. So if you have five fetal cells divided by 250, that will give you the percent of fetal cells. And then you can take that percent or, um, in the decimal form and multiply it by 5,000. So in a average 150 pound patient, there's 5,000 mils of blood in the total circulation. And that will give you the total number of mils. All right, that will give you the total number of mils of fetal cells in the maternal circulation, all right? And then we know that Rogam will clear a 30 mil bleed. So you take the amount of fetal cells divided by 30 um, and take that number. Remember, if that number, uh, the number to the right of the decimal is greater than 0.5 or 0.5 or greater, then you round up, right? If it's uh, 0.4 or less, then you round down. Right, um, and then remember, do not forget to add in one additional vial of Rogam, right? Students oftentimes will forget that. So here in our example, we have uh, five fetal cells observed in 250, so we get 2% take that decimal form, all right, so 0 0.02 times 5,000, that gives you 100 mil bleed. And then divided by 30 mils, because one vial of Rogam will clear a 30 mil bleed, and you get 3.3. This example actually rounded up to four. I believe this should be three plus one, so it would be four vials of Rogam. All right, and then don't forget how to calculate your um, antigen frequency. Remember to always, um, if your patient has an antibody, we always want to give antigen negative blood. So if you're provided the frequency of the antigen, that is the percent of the population that is antigen positive. So in order to get the percent of the population that is antigen negative, you need to subtract from 100. So if X and Y antigens are present in 12 out of 20 donors, in the blood bank, what does this mean? So if X and Y antigens are present together in 12 out of 20 donor units, um, you can divide 12, 
20 by 12. Hold on. So that's 60%. So 60% of the um, donors have antigens X and Y. Sorry, I had a little interruption there. All right, so then if you had the W antigen um, is found in 14 out of 20 donors, what does this mean? Again, that would mean about 75% of the donors have the antigen, 25% do not. So if we were identifying anti-W, we um, would need we would only have 25% of the donors that would be antigen negative. <laughs> He's a mess. <laughs> so then if your patient has multiple antibodies and we need to honor all of their an antibodies by providing antigen negative blood, you would multiply all of those frequencies together. Um, so for antigen W, 25% of the population are antigen negative, 60% um, of the population for X and Y are antigen positive, so that would be 40%. So then you just multiply all of those together. So 40% times 25, and that will give you 12% of the population are negative for W, X, Y antigens. All right, so if you have an O negative person has anti D and anti Duffy A, all right, so remember um, your frequency is given here. Remember, you don't have to memorize those. 66% of your population is Duffy A positive. What percent of people have similar blood? Okay, so remember 45% um, of the population are type O. So we have 45% of the population that's type O. 15% of the population is RH negative. Uh, so 40, no, 34% of the population is Duffy A negative. And then we already included the RH in there. So we have uh, 45 times 15 times 34. And that gets us 2.3% of the population is antigen negative. It was O negative and Duffy A negative. So if you have a patient with a IAT that is negative, cross match for two units, one unit reacts at initial span 37 and AHG, the other unit is okay, what is the problem? All right, so anytime you have a unit that reacts at initial span 37 and AHG you, and your IAT is negative, your first automatic thought should be incompatible ABO, okay? Um, either you grab the wrong type of unit and it's not compatible with your patient, there's been a mistyping, that unit has been mislabeled, Some somehow there is an ABO incompatibility, all right? And so um, you would definitely want to investigate that. Did you grab the wrong unit? Did you use the um, patient's wrong plasma? So, you know, just um, that is an automatic stop right there, okay? Um, and those reactions are going to be very strong too because remember these would be ABO incompatibility. So you're probably going to have a three plus four plus reaction. So that's another indicator that it's ABO um, incompatibility. Um, so thinking back to our quality assurance lecture, can a procedure manual contain whatever the supervisor wants? All right, so that's a definitely no. Um, the Clinical Lab Standards Institute, so CLSI, they establish guidelines that include what must be included in your SOP, right? And so some examples of what must be included in your SOP, usually you have a principle of the test, uh, specimen requirements, um, equipment required to do the test, and then you have specific instructions, step-by-step -step process, any limitations of the test, um, and usually you have uh, reference, so the package insert, 
and then you have a effective date, the date that it went into effect, um, and who it was approved by. There can be others in there too, um, but it can't be just whatever you want. It has to follow a specific format um, and must include certain things. All right, so um, the next question has to deal with documenting your uh, or document control. So record retention. So remember in blood bank, if you identify a patient that has a antibody or an ABO discrepancy, anything like that, that is a permanent record. It will be maintained in blood bank forever. All right, um, electronic. And usually if we identify a patient in, um, in blood bank that has an antibody, we will also keep their, um, we'll have like a little hard copy antibody card for them as well. Um, and then also for your donor testing, if you're ever involved in the donor site, um, any reason that your donor has been deferred, whether it be a permanent deferral or an indefinite deferral, those records are also permanently kept. So that's a forever um, indefinite document control, document retention. For quality control, your QC records, whether that be an electronic mechanism of documenting your QC, any type of paper documentation of QC, it must be kept for a minimum of five years. Um, Any time that you have look backs, um, so unit disposition um, and look backs, those records must be kept for 10 years. So in blood bank, we usually have document retention of five years, 10 years, or forever. Okay. Um, so then the next question is every unit QC for the correct number of cells. So this would be um, checking that each platelet unit has greater than 5.5 times 10 to the 10th number of platelets per unit or making sure that each red cell unit has the appropriate hemoglobin. Not every unit is QC. It's kind of like a random check. Um, it's got kind of do like just a random audit um, and just to, they'll check the pH, they'll check the cell count um, and they do that on a uh, random audit. Not every unit, that would be way too time consuming. Um, so if you give thalassemia or sickle cell patients neocytes, does that reduce their iron overload? So remember transfusing neocytes is a way to um, increase the time between transfusions. So it decreases the number of transfusions, therefore decreasing their iron overload as well and decreases their exposure to um, foreign antigens as well. So one of the side effects of donating through the technique of apheresis is uh, the anticoagulant used during this process is citrate. So the products that are given back to your patient could have some citrate in it. And so citrate will chelate calcium, could cause your patient to develop decreased calcium. So in an effort to treat that, would we want to give calcium carbonate through an IV in their other arm? Um, so no, usually the way that we treat those patients is we will either just give them oral calcium um, or uh, maybe even some Tums. Are there donor requirements for the apheresis? Um, of course, yes, they are. Um, even though they're doing the apheresis donor collection, they still must meet all of the donor requirements. Um, and then if you have a blood with, uh, if you have a patient with autoimmune hemolytic anemia, should they receive blood? Now think about what's going on in autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Your patient probably has some type of autoantibody, whether it be a cold reacting autoantibody or a warm reacting antibody with the warm reacting antibody causing more problems. Um, the warm reacting antibody, you're gonna have pan reactivity. Your IAT is gonna be positive. 
your panel is going to be positive, the DAT is going to be positive, your eluate's going to be positive. When you cross match units with this patient, your cross matches are going to be incompatible. We can do absorptions to try to um, absorb out that warm auto. However, that is not always successful. The problem with transfusing patients with autoimmune hemolytic anemia is that we are unable to identify underlying alloantibodies. So this warm autoantibody could mask a underlying clinically significant alloantibody. So blood bank will recommend that these patients not be transfused. And if they do need to be transfused, then we will have to give them um, least incompatible units. So keep in mind too, if it's more of a warm autoantibody, it's probably of IgG classification, um, which could result in um, some hemolysis, um, could be extravascular as well. Um, if it's a cold autoantibody, um, we could do some pre-warming techniques in um, blood bank to see if it dissolves upon warming at 37 degrees. And if so, then the patient could safely be transfused using a blood warmer. Are directed donations safer than random units? All right, so most people um, would feel safer accepting the blood from somebody they know. However, oftentimes during the donation procedure, um, especially if you ask a family member or a friend to donate blood for you, oftentimes they are not willing to share information from their past that might defer them as a donor. So oftentimes those directed donations are not necessarily safer. Um, and then also, um, if you get into the HLA matching, um, unless it's like a first degree relative or um, you wanna make sure that it's an HLA match too, if you're requiring HLA match, match platelets or anything like that. Uh, so if a patient with a warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia has a underlying allo antibody and has not been transfused in the past three months, can an autoabsorption be performed? So remember, we can do an autoabsorption if the patient has not been transfused in the past three months. And the reason for that is if the patient has been transfused within the past three months, they will have some donor cells remaining in their circulation, right? And remember part of the autoabsorption, it uses the patient cells, um, it treats the patient cells with um, ZZAP, or DDT, right? And then, um, so it removes the antibody from the cells and then we will add those treated cells back to the patient plasma. So now all of those antigen sites on your patient red cells are available. It will absorb out the autoantibody that's present in the patient plasma. So then we have absorbed plasma where that autoantibody should no longer be. All right, the problem occurs if your patient has been transfused within the past three months, the patient cells also contain donor cells with a different type of phenotype. It could um, absorb out the underlying alloantibody, making blood bank um, incapable of identifying it. Okay, so that's the reason for autoabsorptions not being performed if your patient has been transfused with the past three months. If your patient has been transfused within the past three months and they have a warm auto uh, antibody, then we would need to perform a differential absorption. And um, that's different. Instead of using your patient cells, you would use commercially manufactured cells with a known phenotype. Um, so think about uh, negative blood. So pretty much 99.9 .9 to 100% of the adult population is going to have the I antigen on their red cells. So to find I negative blood is almost impossible. Okay. 
Um, and that's usually why in the event that you identify anti big I, it is usually an auto antibody. Um, loves to react at initial spin. Typically, we will see it warm away at 37 degrees. So if these patients have auto anti I, um, blood bank will usually identify this as a cold reacting auto antibody and recommend the use of a blood warmer. Um, and then what product would be given if your patient is deficient in the coagulation factors? Um, we could give FFP, and if you know the specific coagulation factor, you could also give factor concentrates that are available now as well. All right, so what antibody is found in paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria? So remember, in paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria, this is anti-P, and um, it is referred to as a doneth landsteiner antibody, and it's called biphasic. So what happens is the um, antibody, as your blood circulates away from your central core and goes into your extremities, it cools down, all right? The antibody attaches to those red cells, and then as it circulates back to the core, it warms up to 37 degrees. That's when the cell hemolysis will occur. That's why it's biphasic, all right? It has to be exposed to cooler temperatures, and then it has to be warmed back up. Um, so that's why it's called biphasic. It's anti-P. Do not confuse paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria with um, a hemolytic anemia that we talked about in hematology, which is paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, where your patient cells lack um, CD55 and CD58, making them susceptible to lysis by complement. Okay, those are two different conditions, um, but do not confuse paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria associated with anti-P, the doneth landsteiner um, biphasic hem hemolysin. Um, so, if you are working up a patient and they have a um, positive DAT, a drug-induced positive DAT, drug-induced autoimmune hemolytic anemia, is that clinically significant? For blood bank, um, there's really nothing that we can do. It causes a lot of additional testing for blood bank. Um, penicillin is known to do this. Aldament is known to do this. Um, there's really nothing blood bank can do. Um, it does make it difficult for blood bank to identify any underlying allo antibodies um, because it does look like a, a warm auto antibody. Um, and so again, it makes it very difficult for blood bank to identify any underlying allo antibodies. Um, so if you have a cold autoantibody, will it react, and you're doing your DAT, will it react with polyspecific AHG? So remember, these cold autoantibodies are usually of IgM classification. They can activate complement. Um, the C3B, C3D um, can be detected on the cell membrane. Remember, anti-C3B, C3D is included in polyspecific, so we would actually see a reaction with polyspecific AHG. The next step in the test would be to perform monospecific um, AHG, both anti-IgG and anti-C3B, C3 B, C3D. Your IgG, of course, would be negative in the event of a cold autoantibody. Your anti-C3B, C3D would be positive. And then um, would a warm autoantibody react with complement? Um, typically not. Um, typically those warm autoantibodies, they're warm because they're of IgG classification. Um, so however, typically they will not react with um, monospecific IgG, C3B, C3D. However, um, Warm autos don't ever follow the textbook. I have personally seen patient warm auto antibodies that could react with complement. It just depends on the mechanism of the warm auto antibody.
So you will have several sections on the exam um, where you are given mom and baby results. Um, so make sure you review mom's ABO, RH, and IAT results. Um, and then given baby, ABO, RH, and DAT results, can you identify the presence of hemolytic disease of the newborn? Can you determine if mom needs Rogam? All right, um, so make sure you guys review that section. You will have several questions on this exam about that. Um, what's the best method to determine if mom really has weak D or excess fetal cells in her circulation? Um, number one, what you would want to do, you would want to do a fetal screen, and if it's positive, then we would definitely want to do a Klyhire Betke. Um, really, the only way, if you're working in blood bank and you have a maternal patient that pops up weak D positive, um, the only way to know if she is truly weak D positive or in the event she's been involved in a trauma or um, she's recently delivered her baby, the only way is to try to find an established history type on her. Um, so if she has historically been typed as O negative and now she's popping up as weak D positive and she's, um, whether she's delivered or not, and you know the type of the baby, you could determine um, if those are fetal cells in her circulation, all right? So that history plays an important role on the mother as well. Otherwise, um, if you're working at a facility and mom doesn't have a previous history, it is far better, research has shown, to go ahead and give her Rogam than not give it if you're not sure if her weak D testing is a true weak D or if she does have some RH positive fetal cells in her circulation. Um, it won't hurt anything to go ahead and give it to her, um, but always try to look at her previous type on file, even if that um, includes trying to contact her um, prenatal care provider if her um, OB is at another location. Um, and then what does each test in mom and baby workup tell you? All right, so you always want to make sure on your mom that we will do an ABO and RH. If she is initial spin D negative, we always want to do weak D testing on her. We will want to do an IAT for identification of any antibodies. In the event her IAT is positive, we would of course perform a panel for antibody identification. If that antibody is identified as clinically significant, then we need to titer it. And if mom has been um, involved in a trauma or she has recently delivered, we wanna make sure, it, and if she's RH negative, we wanna make sure that no RH positive fetal screens are in her circulation. So we would want to do a fetal screen. Keep in mind that for RH negative mothers, any time before that postnatal Rogam dose is given, a fetal screen must be performed. And again, fetal screens are performed on maternal red cells, right? That's your sample of testing. Don't get that confused with your eluit. Your eluit is performed on the baby. If the baby has a DAT, the elution is performed on the baby red cells, okay? So on the baby, we would test ABO, RH to include weak D testing as well as the DAT. And if that DAT is positive, then we would perform an eluit, whether that be a Louis Fries eluit to investigate ABO hemolytic disease of the newborn or a acid elution such as digitonin to identify any other RH or other IgG antibodies. All right, so looking at basic panels, can you determine the phenotype and the genotype? All right, so if your uh, patient is um, little c positive and big C positive, well then they're heterozygous, their genotype is big C, little c, all right? Um, and then selecting controls for phenotyping. When you select 
your positive controls for phenotyping, whether you're testing a donor, whether you're testing your patient cells, that positive control must be heterozygous. So for in, in the instance you're testing for little c, you would want to find a little c positive cell, but that cell must also be big C positive. And the reason for that is that heterozygous antigen expression, the antigen sites on the cells are being shared, big C and little c antigen sites. So the number of antigen sites are decreased, therefore it weakens the antigenic expression. We want to make sure our antisera can detect the weakest expression. So we must choose that heterozygous cell. Right, for the positive control. For your negative control, you can choose any negative control or any negative cell, all right? That's usually not the issue. You guys need to know for phenotyping that control must be heterozygous. Um, and then can you genotype for D, C, and E? So if you are given a panel and it has your patient phenotyping results, can you determine the genotype of your patient? So if your patient um, phenotyping results indicated D negative, big C negative, big E negative, little c negative, little, or little c positive, little e negative, then you know that your patient lacks the D antigen because they're D negative. So um, their genotype would be little d, little d, and then their um, big C, big E negative. So then they would be little c, little e, little c, little e on both alleles, all right? So being able to recognize that type of genotype. Um, and then make sure you go back and answer uh, or review some of your um, donor deferment questions. You will have um, some questions on that. Remember, um, if your patient has had a tattoo or piercing um, within, that's a one year deferment, 12 months. Um, remember if your patient has had the measles or um, mumps vaccination, that's two weeks. However, the rubella, which is the German measles, that is a four week deferment. So make sure you um, review those deferments. Um, interpret DAT and IAT results. And cold antibody results. So make sure you review your reactions um, versus anti big I versus anti little I, anti IH and anti H. Okay, make sure you guys review those and know the different varying reactions from those. So if, if you have a RH negative uh, pregnant woman, she's driving on I-40, she's involved in a car crash, uh, she has no prenatal care that we can find documentations of or proof of, um, and she comes in with a D titer of one to eight at 30 weeks, um, and that she's estimated to be 30 weeks by her HGC testing or HCG testing, um, what should be done, all right? So her IAT is positive, her panel has identified anti-D, her titer is one to eight, that could be, um, and we don't know if she's had any prenatal care, so that anti-D, is it due to Rogan or is it true active anti-D? So without any previous history, the only way that we can determine is to perform a titer, all right? So we have a current titer of one to eight. This patient needs to come back in two weeks to have a follow-up titer done to see if that anti-D is increasing or decreasing, all right? That is the only way we can tell if it's active anti-D or passive anti-D due to uh, Rogam administration. Um, you would also want to do a fetal screen on her because she, if she uh, is RH negative and um, she's been involved in a trauma, right? So in the event her baby is RH positive and trauma to the abdomen um, could result in a fetal maternal hemorrhage. Um, so we would also want to do a fetal screen. I want you guys to understand the fetal screen has nothing to do with the maternal IAT, all right? Um, so the fetal screen detects the presence of RH positive cells in mom's circulation, okay?
And then would you give her Rogan? Um, at this point, the clinicians probably would decide to go ahead and give her a dose, um, especially dependent upon that fetal screen. If the fetal screen is negative, then she might get an additional dose just to make sure. All right, um, so that is all I have. Um, exam five is scheduled for, I think it's Monday, right? I feel so lost. I've just been doing everything one day at a time. So I should have checked this. I apologize. Yes, so your exam five is scheduled for Monday. Um, you guys take it using Respondus Monitor, um, due by 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time. Make sure that you print your panels prior to accessing the exam. So make sure you uh, print those out to um, make answering the questions easier for you. Um, if you guys have any questions while you're studying, please feel free to um, email me, call my office. Um, I'm happy to help you guys. Um, we didn't really cover too much um, content information from um, in module five. So this exam is, is really kind of um, all encompassing. So make sure you do go back and review that material. Um, donor deferments, hemolytic disease of the newborn. Um, make sure you review that quality assurance lecture. Um, that will be the primary new content material, right? Document control, um, quality control, QI projects, those types of topics. All right, so um, you guys, I apologize for the time confusion. Um, I had a meeting at 8.30 this morning. It went over a little bit. And then when I tried to join the meeting, another faculty member had scheduled another meeting. And so um, it wouldn't let me join in. So I had to make sure that that meeting had ended. Anyway, long story short, um, I apologize if you missed the, the first of the recording uh, or the first of the lecture. So, um, but I'll have the recording posted as soon as it's available. Um, I'll have it in box for you guys to review. All right. All right. Well, you guys, um, let me know if you have any questions and everybody continue to practice social distancing, stay safe. And um, I will see you guys on Tuesday, I guess. <laughs>